twofold the child of hell. Twofold the child of hell. Um, how many of you have heard that? Other than just reading through your Bible, you've heard that used before, where people will uh, say somebody is twofold the child of hell. Now, before I do any reading or go back to the exact quote or context or anything like that, uh, let's just point out it's pretty self-explanatory. But twofold just means like double or twice the amount. Okay, you could have threefold, fourfold. Uh, the Bible talks about sixtyfold, hundredfold. You know, basically that many times more than uh, uh, than just one. So let's just think logically here, some possibilities of what the phrase could mean. Somebody's twofold the child of hell, okay? Meaning, uh, you know, a child of hell, I think just meaning similar to like this, the child of the devil or whatever. In other words, like they're, they're, they're lost, they're on their way to hell. Uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory as well. But so, what are some uh, possibilities, some logical possibilities that that phrase could mean? Someone's twofold the child of hell. Well, I suppose one person could say that hell is going to be, you know, uh, I've heard some people say hotter. To, to, uh, hell is going to be hotter for that person because they're wicked or something like that. So somebody might say, well, this person's twofold the child of hell. Maybe it means that they're going to suffer twofold the punishment of hell. That's an interesting thought. I mean, uh, I don't know, is hell worse for some people than others? Uh, there are some that talk about uh, where Judas, it says that he'll go to his place. And some people have said that he's got a special place reserved for him in hell. Uh, some of the angels that originally fell, it says, talks about them being chained up. Some people have thought about like maybe they're chained in a certain part of hell they're going to be punished in a certain way or satan whenever he goes to the lake of fire is going to be punished in a certain way uh i suppose you could think that that's what it means right so this person is is just going to be worse off you know uh cain when he uh when he killed abel and he cried out for mercy from god he said you know remember he put a a, a mark upon him and he said anybody that uh you know would would kill cain you know, he's going to suffer, uh, I can't remember how much it says, like uh, sevenfold. It said sevenfold what the, you know, what what Cain's punishment was or something. I, I don't remember exactly how it says, but the point is it means more intense. Like it's going to be worse. It's going to be harder. So somebody could maybe say that logically. How about this? They could say, well, maybe they're just partially a child of hell. Like maybe on a scale you know, being a child of hell, like completely, like fully a child of hell. And then you've got like somebody who's only partially a child of hell. Like, you know, that person's a child of hell, but there's still hope. You know what I mean? I could reason that out. I think there's some, uh, some thoughts beyond that. Like, you know, we know that there's a lot of people that are not saved. And so technically the, uh, God, you know, Satan being the God, lowercase g of this world and being their father because they're not saved. Uh, and so they would they would be a child of hell. They're on their way to hell to suffer the same fate as the devil's going to suffer one day. So you say, well, they're a child of hell, but there's still hope for them, right? And then we know that they're, you know, because the, they just have to hear the gospel. They haven't had it explained to them or something like that. But then there are other people, you know, who have just rejected, hardened their hearts, and the Bible talks about them. We might say they've been turned over to a reprobate mind, like Romans 1 says, and they're just, they're, you know, they, they're just absolute, you know, they typically become very wicked, vile people because uh, their whole motivation is just self-oriented and they've closed their mind off to God. That's certainly a possibility. Somebody might say, so like, maybe they're just half the child of hell right now, but they're, you know, whenever they twofold, then they're actually going to be completely a child of hell. I don't know. I guess that's something that you could logically, uh, logically say. Or how about this, that a person in this life is going to do the work that a child of hell does, and they're going to do twice as much. Go to John chapter 14. I'll show you kind of like, we'll compare this. In this story, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's talking about the works that he does on this earth. And so he's talking to those who we would say are children of heaven or children of the kingdom. So that'd be kind of the opposite of being a child of hell, right? And here's what he says, John chapter 14, verse 12. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So we know nobody can do something that's 
better than Jesus. I mean, nobody's going to come and do better miracles or be closer to God than Jesus was. Uh, none of those things happen. But what he's saying is that you're going to do more than I did, more than I accomplished on this earth because I go to my Father. But I have trained you and prepared you and taught you so that now you can, as children of God, you can go out there and do the work that I've called you to do, and you can do it greater, greater than I did it. So, so you know, more numerous works, more, uh, you know, lasting effects, because the way that uh, evangelism goes, you know, if you win somebody else to the Lord, and then now both of you win somebody to the Lord, then eventually you've got this exponential growth, right? And uh, and you can, you know, I, I'm sure you've done that before where you double two, and then it's four, and then you double that, you know, four times, uh, four, times four is... Well, I'm not going to play this game because I'm eventually going to, <laughs> and you keep doubling, doubling, doubling. Okay, <laughs> and so uh, uh, you know you understand how that goes, kind of like compound interest, right? And so you know if if Jesus, with a small amount of of disciples, said you're going to do greater works than I, and what did the even in the Book of Acts, these guys were saying these men that turned the world upside down, right? Just a handful of men going out and doing great works. And of course, the Bible says they grew and they multiplied and lots of people got saved and lots of people were going out and continuing to do the work. Now, could that be what he's talking about? Twofold the child of hell, meaning, hey, you've gone and you've, you've made proselyte. You've, you've, you've won them to yourself, to your viewpoint. You're teaching them, you're instructing them, you're equipping them. And now they're going to go out and they're going to be twofold the child of hell that, than you are, right? Because they're going to, uh, kind of like whenever Elisha asked God for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, you know, and go out and just do twice as much, get twice as much accomplished, twofold the child of hell. That's a possibility, All right? So there's just some thoughts. Maybe there's others you can think about uh, just without even looking at context, just twofold the child of hell. What could that mean? Now, it's important if you're in Matthew chapter 23, it's important that we look at how this verse is actually quoted by Jesus and that we give a little bit of context here. So look at verse 15, Matthew 23, verse 15. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Okay, so saying he's saying you're making twofold more the child of hell than yourselves, meaning that you're a child of hell, and now you're bringing these other people to be twofold the child of hell. Okay, so that's important. And then uh, if you compare that, uh, well, let me stop first and, and say this. Okay, what does he mean you go and you uh, make one proselyte? Okay, and I, and I think he's talking about, hey, you compass about, you, you, you go all throughout looking for that one soul, that one person. And when you find him, you make him, you know, twofold more the child of hell than yourself. And so, uh, and so the Pharisees and the scribes, you know, the people who wrote the things down and they kept the law, the Bible calls them sometimes lawyers. And, uh, and these were really concerned about the Old Testament and the laws that was given to Moses. And so they <clears throat> went about... Uh, you know, trying to convince people that they're right. And it talks about proselyting. Now, some people would say like, well, what is he talking about? Because when did the Pharisees and the Jews ever actually go out evangelizing and proselyting? But interesting, and I won't, I'll try not to make too much out of this, but if you go through the Bible, you'll see that there were Jews who were proselytes, okay? That meaning that they, they weren't born a Jew, they became a Jew. Which really is an interesting argument for those who, who believe like God deals differently with the Jews than he does with the Gentiles. And then, you know, then the church is this whole other entity. You got church, Jews, Gentiles. And I know where they get that from. I know where some of those ideas come from. But it really messes it up when you hear Jesus talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 this New Testament, this new covenant. And you see people saying, hey, there's, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile and, and, uh, and all that. And then you realize that even in the Old Testament, it was possible for Gentiles to become Jews. And so it would be calling Jews. You know, we'd be saying that, hey, these, these guys are Jews, 
but they're Jews that are proselyte, proselyte, okay? So they become Jews. And so we see that, for instance, in the book of Esther, Esther chapter 8, verse 17. You don't have to go there, but we see that after what happened to Haman and after we have the, uh, uh, the works of the Jews and God showed them favor, and so we see a lot of people became proselytes. They became Jews, because they feared God and, and they wanted to be on that. Uh, you know, even when the children of Israel uh, came out of Egypt, it says that there were a lot of Egyptian, uh, like mixed e Egyptians that came out of there. And, uh, and, and some of that was maybe by birth. Maybe they had, you know, their mother was, was Is Israelite and the father was Egyptian and then the child just went with them. But there seems to be also just a group of people that left Egypt and said, hey, I'm going with them. You know, kind of like, I mean, they, Moses was... Uh, was part of that by birth, uh, by, but, but you know how he left to be with his people. Maybe some others said, hey, I'm going as well. Uh, and then we see when we come to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the famous story of the day of Pentecost, where they had a mixed group of people that spoke all these different languages. And God was able to use them through the Holy Spirit to be able to speak languages, that th these people's native languages, so that they could understand. But if you read that in Acts chapter 2, it says that among them were Jews and Jewish proselytes. Okay, so there were a lot of people that came to become uh, Jews as you read through, uh, through the scripture. Look at John chapter 9. Once Jesus was being recognized as the Messiah and, and everybody was... A lot of people were turning to him and following him and going after the miracles. The Pharisees kind of picked up their game and said, hey, we got to stop this. Too many people are going to him, and we got to figure out what we're going to do about this, how we're going to stop, stop Christ. And so John chapter 9 is a story where uh, the blind man is given back his sight. One of my favorite stories here. I love how the blind man approaches the, the Pharisees and kind of argues with them. But John chapter 9, look at verse 20. His parent, okay, let's start actually verse, uh, let's start with verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them saying, is this your son who ye say was born blind? And I was like, who ye say? Like they're doubting it. They're, is this some kind of show? Are you faking it? What's going on? Is this your child that you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answering them and, uh, and answered them and said, "We know not. I mean, we know that this is our son, and he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know. Uh, we know not. Or what hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him; he shall speak for himself." Then it says this in verse twenty-two: "These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be." put out of the synagogue, okay, like just, you know, banished from the family, banished from that because he was uh, pro professing Christ. And other places, even some among the, uh, some the, uh, among the Pharisees, like, you know, Nicodemus, we see in John 3 how he goes to Jesus at night. And then later on, you know, some of these Pharisees are calling out like, is any other, there? you know, because they were supposed to grab, get Jesus and they didn't have him. And they said, what happened? Are you guys being converted as well? And, and so he's looking out, which other of you have, uh, you know, have believed this? And so they're really putting the pressure on. They don't want anybody to follow Christ. They're trying to stop people from following Christ. That's important to this story because look up a couple of verses prior. So you're in Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse 13. So 15 is their main, uh, main text here, but I mean the main verse here, but look at verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So it's important to this story to recognize that these are people who are lost, people who are rejecting Christ, People who do not want the gospel to go out. They do not want Christ to be preached. They want to turn people from Christ, which is the only way to go to heaven, right? Through Christ. By no, there's no other name whereby men must be saved. So, uh, so, you know, they're trying to stop people. Now, they're not going to heaven because they rejected Christ. And so now they're trying to stop other people from going to heaven. So he's saying, look, you know, you are, uh, you're shutting up the kingdom of heaven 
and you're not going in and you're trying to stop people that would come to, to Christ so that they could go and you're trying to stop them from doing that. Now that's, uh, that's important, like I said, to this, to this context of what it means. You make them twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Okay. So let me give you a few points on this. And uh, some of you guys are on uh, social media and, and maybe are familiar with the conversation that I had. Something that just kind of an ongoing thing. This wasn't towards me. Uh, I kind of took it personally and shouldn't have, but it was just because uh, this is something that we get attacks on a lot, you know, from our church and churches that would go soul winning like we do. And one of the big things that people bring up is just this lack of, of repentance, not looking for a change. Uh, another thing that's brought up is leading people in prayer and then saying, hey, praise the Lord, if you believe that you're saved and, and giving them this false confidence, they say. And, and, uh, and there's all kind of accusations that we get. And I've heard numerous times people say, well, all you're doing is you're going out there and you're making people twofold the child of hell. And that's out of context, first of all. It doesn't even fit the, the narrative. And second of all, I want to see exactly what is being, being said in this, in this story here. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a rebuttal in the sense of, like, this is anybody who would say, like, we're making people twofold the child of hell. You know, I, I want to say that that's ridiculous, okay? And then, and I'll ex explain a little bit about that as uh, through these points. But number one is this. This cannot apply to someone who preaches the gospel of Christ, okay? It can't apply to someone who preaches the gospel of Christ because the Pharisees rejected Christ. And it was very important that people didn't believe in Christ. So why would they bring up the name of Christ? Why would they preach the gospel at all? Okay, they didn't. They wanted to stop people from... Uh, from believing in Christ. Look at 1 John chapter 2. A few times in the Bible, it uses the word antichrist. Okay, and typically we call the that person who's going to come one day, a world leader that's going to bring everybody together and is going to uh, bring a persecution upon uh, believers, we call him the Antichrist. And actually the Bible never uses it like that. There's never an Antichrist with a capital A. There's never the Antichrist. Uh, it talks about those who are Antichrist or those who uh, have the spirit of Antichrist like we see in this passage right here. Uh, okay, now it's all right if you say that. We understand you're talking about the Antichrist, like the ultimate person, you know, or, but the Bible talks about this, the man of sin, uh, a man of perdition. It talks about the beast, you know, in Revelation. And these are all references to this man that we call Antichrist. But look, the Bible talks about many Antichrists, many people who have the spirit of Antichrist. First John chapter 2, verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Look, it's very important to know that in this day, he was still, they were still fighting these Pharisees. They were still fighting these Jews who rejected Christ and said, no, 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 we believe in the Father, but we reject the Son. And to this day, there are people that say, well, the Jews you know, they still worship the same God we do. No, they don't. No, they don't, because they rejected the, the Son. And if you reject the Son, then you don't have the Father either. That says right here very clearly. And this is what Jesus said very clearly whenever he was going against these Pharisees who rejected him and these scribes that rejected him. So a proper interpretation of this is going to say, hey, this is somebody who rejects Christ, doesn't want people to know Christ. He's shutting them up from coming to Christ and entering into the kingdom. And look, they're not going to heaven. And now they're stopping people and making them twofold uh, more the child of hell than themselves. OK, um, so here's a, another thing. Look at Philippians chapter one. Now, this is uh, our focus on worldwide evangelism. And remember last year, whenever we had this month uh, in this focus, I talked about the fact that in all the world, there are a huge amount. I don't remember what the number was. I think it was two thirds of the world is Christian, right? By name, they call themselves Christians. Now we know a lot of people profess Christ who aren't Christians, but in the world, there are that many people who, who profess to be Christians. And if you talk to them, they know 
who Jesus Christ is. Okay, if you talk to them, they know uh, maybe the story of a virgin birth, right? Mary, uh, maybe they put too much emphasis on Mary, but they believe that there was a virgin birth. Many of them, because Catholicism is a huge part of the people that name Christianity, you know, many of them believe in the Trinity. Many people that claim, claim to be Christians believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We believe that as well. Okay, so, uh, so a lot of people will name the name of Christ. They'll talk about the fact that He came, his, the atonement on the cross. Maybe they don't understand it, but they'll talk about that. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. Some indeed, this is Paul talking, and Paul's in prison here, and uh, there are people that are still preaching the gospel, and some of them have the wrong motive. Okay, So he says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now, I don't think it's talking about they preach Christ of contention. It's saying they preach Christ of contention. That's their motivation. Their motivation is, is contention. Their motivation is envy, okay? And it makes it clear in this text that they're, they're envious of Paul. You know, hey, well, he gets too much credit. Oh, too many people are, are following him and liking him. This seemed to be a thing that people did in that day with their disciples. Remember, they, they asked uh, John the Baptist, they said, hey, this Jesus, like, you know, he's, the, he, he, he's got more disciples than, than you. He, his disciples are baptizing more people than, than, than John. What do you think about that? Right? This was a big deal because all these guys wanted to have this following. And so, uh, uh, so that seems to be a big deal. Well, these guys that were going out preaching the gospel, there seemed to be some kind of envy and some kind of strife that was motivating them to go out and do more work than Paul or, or whatever. I don't know exactly what their motivation was, but he's saying that it was one of envy, one of contention. And so then he goes on and he says, uh, let's see here. What then, verse 18, what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therefore do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now let me tell you this. I I don't like the I don't like Catholicism. If you have never caught that, I bring it up a lot in my messages, right? Because false gospel, a lot of people are going to hell and and they're saying, hey, we're, we're Christians, right? We're, we're believers. And then we listen to what they preach as a gospel message, and they are, they're not saved, okay? However, isn't it much easier to win somebody who's a Catholic to the Lord, who knows that Jesus exists and knows that, you know, there was a virgin birth and no, they have a basis. They have some understanding of these things in the Bible. You know, maybe they put too much emphasis on tradition. Maybe they put too much emphasis on, uh, you know, what the father said or whatever, but they have a basic understanding of the Bible and we can build on that and we can, we can, you know, we can, we can go off that. Now, again, a big portion of the world that claims to be Christianity is from the efforts of the Catholic church. Now they're lost, Right. But it's been spread throughout the world to where we can go to so many countries throughout the world and find people who believe in Jesus, find people who know about the cross. You know, they probably got a crucifix <laughs> They're, uh, hanging up on their wall. They probably got something around their neck or whatever, but they know who Christ is and all that kind of stuff. Now, am I happy that the false gospel is being preached? Of course not. Am I happy that, you know, they're, they might be kind of leading people astray, confusing them? shutting up the kingdom of heaven from him and all those kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't like those things. But, you know, even, even those people, though, who are preaching Christ, but they're, but they're wrong, or they're preaching Christ with the wrong motive or whatever the, the, the reason is that they're preaching, you know, I don't even think that that person can be included in this illustration, you know, I might be tempted to say, hey, they're making people twofold the child of hell. But wait a minute, wait a minute. They are preaching Christ. Now, they're not getting anybody saved, but they are preaching Christ. So are they making anybody, are, are, is anybody that they are, they're leading astray, 
going to receive greater punishment in hell now that they, it's like, well, you were just lost, but now you're, now you're Catholic lost. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you were just lost, but you know, if you're going to believe that, well, then hell's going to be hotter for you than it was if, before you were just, you were just lost. Look, they're lost. Okay. They're lost. So if somebody is preaching the fault, a false gospel or preaching with the wrong motive, maybe filthy lucre's sake or whatever the case, they're actually not getting people, you know, they're not to become two, twofold more the child of hell than, than, than them. You know what I mean? Uh, even that, I don't believe, completely fits this story. Look at, uh, uh, let me see here. I missed a, a whole bunch of stuff. Because, um, I mean, really, so if somebody's lost, because here, here's, here's what I've heard said. Now, you're, well, you're going out there, and here's why you're making them twofold the child of hell, right? Which is not what he said. He said you'd make them twofold more the child of hell than yourselves, okay? But here's how you're making them twofold the child of hell. They were lost, and now they have confidence that they're saved, even though they're not saved. Now, look, can somebody be more lost than they were yesterday, like, like more lost? I guess, again, if they became a reprobate, I guess that would be one thing. But here's, here's the, the deal. When I knock on the door and somebody says, you know, or, or, you know, I say, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? Oh, absolutely. They're confident, aren't they? Well, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm a good person and I try to read the Bible and I do this and, and I pray every day and I do all those kinds of things. And you're like, this person's lost. Now, let's say I convince them to say whatever I want them to say. I mean, maybe, I mean, who knows? Let's not... Let's not talk about the sinner's prayer right, right yet. Let's say that I, I just convinced them of some kind of weird, weird doctrine. And then I leave that place and say, well, God bless you. I'm glad that you're going to heaven and I'll see you whenever you get to heaven. Is that person more lost than they were before I knocked on the door? No, still lost. Is that person more confident that they're going to heaven than they were when I knocked the door? Probably not because they are already quite sure that they're going to heaven. I mean, when's the last time you went to a funeral and somebody got up there to speak? I mean, it, I'm sure it happens, but somebody got up there to speak about their loved one and said, well, we know where he is today. <laughs> you know? No, everybody's like, oh, well, we know that they're in a better place and they're looking down on us or whatever. I mean, that's their hope. That's their confidence. Now, how legitimate that is, you know, I don't, I, I can't speak for the individual, but here's what I know. If you're a child of God and you truly believe in Jesus Christ and you pr truly believe in the gospel and you're trusting in that for your salvation, then I believe you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit within you says, you're saved. You're a child of God. Now, there might be times where you kind of get a little bit of a doubt there or maybe you're not living for the Lord or you're not reading your Bible or whatever. You're starting to feel like, man, I feel so distant from the Lord. I don't know. Am I even saved? I've heard Christians ask me that before. But then when they start reasoning it out and they're like, I know I'm saved. What am I talking about? Okay. Because they have that Holy Spirit within them. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verse 16. The Spirit itself, that's a capital S, Holy Spirit. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So here's the thing. When we do something for the Lord, and we're like, man, why am I even doing this? There's kind of like this little something in our heart that says, oh yeah, I know why I'm doing this because one day I'm going to be in heaven and none of this stuff in this life even matters, you know? And, uh, and, there, and, and I talked about this here recently in, in 1 John, it talks about somebody having the anointing. I can't remember if that was Thursday. I talked about this with, they have the anointing. It says, you don't even need anybody to teach you. Okay. Cause the Holy spirit teaches you certain things. It even teaches you how to love the brethren, right? There's the Holy spirit within you. And it's just something that comes naturally if you're walking in the spirit. I mean, there's obviously Christians can be, uh, you know, living in sin or whatever, and maybe not be walking in the spirit. But when we do those things, we have the evidence inside us from the Holy Spirit. When we do walk with the Lord, when we do uh, pray to him or we read our Bible or whatever, there's this 
this confidence that says, man, I, you know, I need to get back to this because this is God's my father. And I need to, you know what I mean? There's that, there's that drawing there. So when I believe when somebody, and here's the thing, the people that say like, oh, you're just going out there, one, two, three, repeat after me, and you're just leading people in a prayer and all that, which isn't true. And I've always given an open you know, invitation for those people that accuse us of that to come out and uh, go soul winning with us and show us how it's done. I've never seen them show up to do it, okay? But the thing is, what they always accuse us of is, uh, where was I going with this? <laughs> okay, what they always accuse us of is, uh, is giving people this, this false sense of security, right? And the thing, and, and then here's what they'll say, you can't make somebody get saved the Holy Spirit does that. So all you can do is go out there and preach the gospel and preach that they're going to hell if they don't trust Jesus and all that, and then let the Holy Spirit do the work. So then I'm like, well, if that's the case, then why are you accusing us of, you know, <laughs> you know doing something wrong? If it's the Holy Spirit, well, why don't I just preach the gospel? And there's nothing I can do after that, whether I lead them in a prayer or don't lead them in a prayer or whatever, nothing I can do because it's the Holy Spirit's job. And they say, no, 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 but you've, you've hindered, now you've given them this false sense of security and you know, here's what I've just found in my life. Like, I think most of the people that bring these accusations against any soul winner, you know, most of the time they're not going out there soul winning at all. You know, and if they are, it's probably just like, well, I don't want to have to like think about whether or not they're getting saved or not, so I'm just going to go preach and then just go off. And and so my thing is like, well, I mean, how do you not? Because we're supposed to not only get people saved, but then we're supposed to get them baptized. And then we're supposed to, you know, get them into church so that we can begin discipling them, whatever, okay? So, like, if you don't know the person saved, how do you know you can baptize them? <laughs> you have to, at some point, have this, like, this person saved. And how do you know that? Well, you have to wait, and you have to watch their fruit, and you have to see how they live. Well, first of all, that's not salvation, right? Our works isn't our salvation. Second of all, you got a whole lot of scripture that shows something different, like Philip, you know, whenever he preaches to the to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. They just go straight down into the water. He didn't have time to watch his fruit and watch his life and see how, it, see how things went. In Acts chapter 2, when they says 3,000, okay, this one evangelistic effort, 3,000 people get saved. And it says, and they were baptized and they were added to the church. That's a lot of people to baptize. How do they know there were 3,000? I'm assuming somebody kept count. Now I've heard some people say, well, the Holy Spirit, that's why it's in the Bible because the Holy Spirit said so. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit used men and women and humans to write things down. You ever read the book of Numbers or, or, or <laughs> Chronicles? I mean, people were keeping records of things, okay? And these people kept record. Now, how do you know 3,000 people got saved? I'm assuming they said that they believed and that <laughs> they received the gospel whenever it was preached to them. So I said, praise the Lord, and then they baptized. Now, did they lead them in a prayer? I don't, I don't know. But see, there's a misconception about what we mean what, what we do when we lead somebody in a prayer, you know, because I believe we've tried to make it very clear in our like demonstrations and stuff that we've given and in the lectures at the Focus on Evangelism conference. Like what we're doing oftentimes isn't even really a prayer. It's just kind of like a repeat after me finalization, like admitting and confessing that they actually believe that, right? In, in many ways, it's not like, well, get on your knees right now and beg God for forgiveness and ask him into your heart or whatever. Well, you know who does that? Actually, the crowd is <laughs> saying that we're doing it wrong. And none of that is salvation. Salvation is putting your trust in Jesus Christ. So if they put their trust in Jesus Christ and we give them an opportunity to say, hey, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die for me. I'm putting my faith in Jesus, you know, and I receive him as my Savior. And we say, praise the Lord, you're saved. That's all we, that's all we can go off is that, they're, is that they said that they're saved and they believe it. Now, if we come back later and we say, how do you know you're saved? They say, well, you know, I've been pretty good. Okay, then they didn't get it. That's not our fault. <laughs> you know, I mean, and even if it is our fault. Are we making them twofold more the child of hell than ourselves? No, because I'm certainly not going to hell. <laughs> I know I'm saved. And I know that I'm preaching Christ and I'm preaching the right gospel. There's literally nothing I can do to make somebody more lost by me preaching the gospel to them. Okay. Now, I could turn it back on them and say, well, you're making people more lost because you're teaching them there's a works-based salvation. And now they think they got to go out and do the works. But look, we're both just at that point, you know, 
uh, comparing how we do it or whatever. And the fact is, I think people that preach the Lordship salvation aren't getting people saved. They think people that lead somebody in prayer aren't getting people saved. The fact is we're all preaching Christ. So nobody's making, none of those groups that we're talking about are making people twofold more the child of hell than ourselves. If we're saved, okay. So you ask, well, then who is this talking about? Who's a Pharisee then? Now we call people Pharisees because we think about the religious leaders of the day being Christians. Okay. And so we say Pharisee is somebody who's a hypocrite. They're Christians and they're saying everyone else needs to follow the rules of the, of the Bible, but then they don't actually do it. We say uh, someone who's real judgmental. We say, yeah, that's being a Pharisee. Somebody who is, uh, you know, going about bringing everybody under, under, hey, you got to do this like this, and you got to look like me when this happens, and you got to, uh, you know, keep all these Old Testament laws and all this stuff. It, but they're saved, and they're Christians, but they just put an emphasis on this. You know, uh, you know, we would say, well, even if, even if they were saved, I should say, even if they were saved, we would say, well, that person's being a Pharisee. Right, because they're they're you know judging people and being a hypocrite and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and I understand why we do that because we're thinking about religion and Old Testament law. Christians have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and so we still kind of put that in the same category. But I'm gonna tell you this: I don't think, at least in this case, a Pharisee can be somebody who is a saved person or a Christian. Okay, in this case, a Pharisee is somebody who is literally trying to keep Christ from people which is the Jews today, which are Pharisees, okay? Which is uh, this other group that I'm gonna tell you, this is the third point. I would say that this best fits today's professors and educators, okay? Public school, uh, you know, the, the gurus who, who, the scientists and all that who uh, claim to, uh, to know all, the, uh, all, all, the, all that there is to know out there about how the world works and all this kind of stuff. Today's religion is not Judaism or paganism, uh, although paganism is on the rise, <laughs> but today's religion is secular humanism, all right? What do I mean by that? Well, humanism is just kind of like the idea that, you know, who cares about God? You know, we need to do what's best for human nature. You know, you need to believe in yourself. You need to have, uh, be able to do what you want that makes you happy, you know, the pursuit of happiness, and, uh, and, you need, and, and we can't stop anybody else from being, uh, being happy and all these kind of, these are all humanistic ideas. Okay. So secular humanism says we don't even bring God into the picture. We just establish what is best for humans. And so this ha has fit really well into our modern education, the public schools and all that of this atheism, agnostic, you know, just kind of, hey, who, who cares if, if there's a, a creator out there or not? Like, we're just going to look at the science and we're just going to look all that. And so I've met people that were atheists, like self-proclaimed atheists. I don't even believe in a God. But once you start getting down the intricacies of nature and you're just like, wasn't well, that amazing? I mean, how did they just happen randomly? Like, how do you really believe that this just happened just spontaneously or, or anything like that? And they'll say, no, 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 no. We believe there was this force that always existed. And we believe that there was matter that always existed. And so, and, and we believe that the universe is like creating itself and all this stuff. Ah, so you believe the universe is God, but you just don't want to believe the God of the Bible. That's what it really comes down to. Okay. So the science becomes their religion and, uh, and the professors are their like evangelists and all that kind of stuff. And guess what? Humanism says, Oh, we accept all religions. If that religion's good for you, great. If this religion is good for this person over here, great. Everybody can have their own religion as long as we get along. Okay. Here's the problem with saying like all religions are great. I just the other day we were knocking on the door and the guy said, you know, I just kind of think that I was Braden, you were with me, weren't you? He says, I think that you know, if if this and this guy was claiming to be a Christian, but he said, you know, I think like if, if you really believe in whatever religion you were raised to believe in, like if you really believe that, then you'll go to heaven. <laughs> I mean, like, where did he get that idea? How could he claim to be a Christian and get that idea? Because that's what society is teaching right now. They're teaching this thing that like, hey, just that's good for them. You just, you just do what's good for you and let them don't judge people and all that kind of stuff. And so he believed that, well, he, I don't think he, who could really believe that? But he claimed that, well, as long as you do 
what you believe and you really put your faith in it, you really put your trust in it, and that's going to work for you and that's going to get you to heaven. Well, if there's two religions that disagree with each other, they can't be both right. <laughs> okay? So when someone says, oh, we believe in all religions, what they mean is, I don't believe in any religions. Okay? So here's the thing. What they say is, we accept all religions except fundamentalism. Okay? I don't mean just Christian, fundamentalist Christianity, but fundamentalist Muslims, like they'll say, oh, Muslims are beautiful people and they, they are so good and they're peaceful and they're loving and they're kind, they're a religion of peace and they never do anybody any harm and all that. And you're like, well, what about this and this, this? Well, that's the fundamentalists. Okay. And what they mean by that is that's the ones who really believe in their religion. <laughs> they actually study the Quran and they actually know these things and they actually are zealots for it. We don't want that. So it's like, well, I'm a Christian. Oh, that's not a problem. I have lots of friends that claim to be Christians. Okay? We don't have a problem with it until you actually believe it and start living by it and start forcing that on other people. Then your religion is not accepted. So you see how humanism is just like, oh, let's all get along. Let's all do this kind of stuff. But you're not allowed to really believe it and force it on other people. Okay? And so I believe that today that is in our society, that's the religion of now. Now, if, you know, if we were working among Jewish people, then I would say, hey, boy, this applies really well because the Jews are still trying to hold people under the Old Testament law and all that stuff. But we don't really live in a society that's Jewish. We, don't li we live in a society, you would say, oh, yeah, but it's a Christian society. No, it's not. It's a humanistic society that claims that you can live however you want to live, be whoever you want to be. Uh, if a man wants to be a girl, he says, that's fine. If he wants to, you know, if these two people uh, want to be together, love is love and all this kind of stuff. I mean, this is the religion of the day, is it not? So anybody that gets on there and says, well, let me show you what the Bible says. They want to shut that person up. And so the Bible says about these Pharisees, they cross land and sea, they compass about, Right. You ever heard of the fact that we, as in the United States, I've, I've brought this up on numerous occasions, but are sending ambassadors to other parts of the world to represent the United States and represent not just the United States, other countries are doing it as well, to represent this humanism, which is kind of becoming this one world religion, don't you think? You know, like you can believe it, just don't believe it extremely. And just your tradition, your family, that's great. But what we really know is that you know, there's just the science and then there's and this logic and mathematics and all that kind of stuff. That's really the religion. And when we say, look, I don't really care what your science says. The Bible says that there's a science falsely so called and I'm using the Bible as my standard for authority. For authority. They're going to say, well, we need to get this guy. We need to shut him up. Okay. And they might not even know that they're doing it, but here's what they're doing. They reject Christ and they're going to hell. And what they want is to make proselytes other people who they can send forth and be an ambassador for them and cause lots of people to not be able to go to heaven. Okay? These are twofold more the, child of, the children of hell than they will become twofold more the children of hell than, uh, than these Pharisees. That's what I believe is the best uh, explanation of that for today. <clears throat> so these are... Are what we're talking about, these proselytes, I mean, are these, uh, not proselytes, uh, professors and educators of the day that are making proselytes, these are they who are going into the kingdom of God. I mean, sorry, they're not going into the kingdom of God and they're, for, and they're keeping others from going as well. These are they who cross land and sea to make one proselyte. And, uh, and whenever they find them, they make them twofold fold more of the children of hell than they. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you help us to keep preaching the gospel. And Lord, you've uh, verified to us many times uh, and encouraged us to just keep on doing what we're doing. And I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to use us to be a mouthpiece and spread the gospel. Uh, we know not everybody will believe it when they hear it, uh, but I pray that you'll help us be patient and do the best we can to make the gospel known and give people the opportunity to receive that gospel. And then, Lord, do the work through your Holy Spirit as, the, as Jesus is lifted up. Draw people unto, unto him. And I pray that you will help us not get discouraged by anybody that would try to uh, convince us to do it a different way. 
but help us just do the best that we can, most efficiently that we can, and to the best of our ability. We pray you be glorified as you uh, produce the fruit, and, uh, and we'll be just uh, happy to give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.